ser así Take rest, cause the living God is living in my chest Every day I wake up feeling blessed And even if I don't, I see it as a test <laughs> Cause I was lost until you found me Now I know you're all around me Nothing I could ever do To separate my love from you You came to set us free You came to set us free Thankful you ain't drive me in that pit. Hey now, nah, nah. saw my soul inside that fam and said that's it. Grace now, nah, nah. you never flake in the car winner. I just came to borrow with the gold winners. Fast forward, turn to a road Now this is a word that God has given me for our church today. In Genesis chapter three, verse one to seven. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, I want you just to, if you're taking notes, just highlight the word more crafty. One translation says, he's cunning. See, the devil is determined to kill, steal, and destroy. And why he's crafty? Because sometimes, or most of the time, he uses logic and human reasoning to get you to doubt the Word of God. He'll use, sometimes he'll use logic to get you to question the Word of God. That's why he's crafty and he's uh, nasty because he's determined to kill, steal, and destroy. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The framing of that question has an underlying motive. Would you agree? There's an underlying motive in that question. The devil's tactic has not changed. He will always sow seeds of doubt. He will always try and make you doubt the Word of God. His motivation in questioning, did God really say? He wants Eve to be suspicious of what God had said, trying to sow the seed of doubt. Because Satan knows if he can get Eve to doubt God, then he can also get Eve uh, to be easily deceived to believe in the lie. It normally starts with the doubt, and once the bait is taken, then they would be easily deceived because doubt will start working, and then deception kicks in. So he said, did God really say, you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat um, fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. Now watch the deception. Satan knows he's got her attention. Watch, he now sows the deception. You will not certainly die. The serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open. Now watch the bait and you will be like God. Can you picture that? You will be like God, knowing good and evil. The bait, six, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good, for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. Now just pause on that for a minute. Eve would have walked past this tree prior to this day. She would have walked past that tree so many times, yeah? She would have seen that fruit so many times and wouldn't think anything of it. 
So what made this day different from every other day? Simple, because the devil, the serpent, got her to focus on the fruit instead of focusing on what God had said. He got her attention to focus on the benefit of sin rather than focusing on what God had said. What you give attention to will grow. That's very important. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed thick leaves together and made coverings for themselves. In the next two weeks, I'm going to be speaking about beware of the serpent. Beware of the serpent. There was a warning. Uh, I had a dream a while back. And I believe it was a warning from the Lord, which will explain to you why we've been gathering and praying as a community, as the churches of our town. Not just here, it also explains to you why I have a heart for the Sunshine Coast. As you saw, the gathering of the churches from the Sunshine Coast was enormous. That's why it happened in the last two years because there is a massive warning. God, it was a warning for the body of Christ in general. So the dream was this. I was walking into a church gathering. It was packed. And I saw people standing, praising God. Standing and worshiping. Some were crying. Some were just worshiping God. But I also saw people sitting down and doing nothing just sitting there so you had people worshiping and people just sitting there not interested in tuning in or getting into just sitting there but what i saw in that dream was something even more uh stirring as those people were sitting i saw these snakes they would have been about five six or seven there was a number of them these snakes, they all had two heads, two heads, and they were crawling on the floor. But here's the thing, they were crawling on the floor and they bypass the ones who were worshiping and worshiping and lifting Jesus. They were going after the Christians that were sitting down, doing nothing. So as the enemy, as the serpent will crawl, they started crawling up to their legs, crawling up to their neck and strangling them. But what made me shock was that those people sitting there, they didn't even flinch. They, it's almost like they didn't know that they've been strangled. The enemy made his way and started strangling them and I'm standing there going, what do you wake up? There was no reaction. There was no resistance to the serpent strangling them. It's almost like they're hmm, just that. And as I was pondering on that, the Lord spoke to my heart and said, this is the result when Christians are spiritually dead. Spiritually dead. They have no idea when the enemy attacks. They're not even aware when the enemy attacks. It saddens and breaks the heart of God. When you see Christians who once were on fire and then this serpent creeps in and starts pulling them away from God. It breaks the very heart of God. Beware of the serpent. Now this week alone, watching different churches, watching the body of Christ coming together and worshiping it was awesome and powerful you stand there and you marvel because i saw pentecostals praying together with catholics praying together with um, lutherans anglicans methodists baptists there was nobody held up a banner saying this is who i am all you saw was the body of Christ praying together. 
not only not only they were praying together they were worshiping together they were clapping together i even saw some of them dancing together doing things that they would not normally do in their own churches there's a word for that is called freedom where the spirit of the lord is there is liberty so that and they, they were just worshiping god together hear this I even heard some hardcore Baptists speaking in tongues, praying in tongues. And I remember leading over to one Bapo and I said, mate, you're not a very good Bapo, are you? And he was just praising God. This is why the devil hates it when the body of Christ comes together to worship because it weakens its power. It weakens its influence. It weakens what he does. So what the devil does, he tries to bring discouragement. He uses logic to discourage people from coming. So thoughts of, well, you can pray right in the comfort of your own home. You don't need to be there. Pray in the comfort of your home. Who can relate to what I'm saying? Or he uses words, logic like, hey, listen, you're not a very good prayer. You sound silly when you pray. Those people, they know how to pray. But when you get there, you're going to sound silly. Beware of the serpent. Satan will use everything to stop God's people from gathering. There's a powerful testimony from an ex-Satanic worshiper. And he tells the story of uh, there was a time when they do uh, astral traveling. And he said, we would go through cities, go through cities and just pray against that city. And then he said, you know, we pray to release demons, to bring havoc on families and marriages and people. He said, that's what they do. And they're still doing that today. They go through to bring, they're determined to kill, steal and destroy. Then they sit back and watch families fight. They sit back and watch marriages do this. That's what they do. But then he said, but now and then we'll come across a city or a town or a region where there's a bunch of Christians gathers and pray. And he said, do you know how annoying that is? He said, because when they come in, their power literally is powerless. It doesn't work when they come in to that city. It literally disarms their power. So what do they do? They move on to the next city. Listen, don't underestimate the power of prayer. Don't ever underestimate the coming together of the body of Christ and calling upon the name of Jesus. Who's heard of Carl, of uh, 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 Carlson Pearson? Carlton Pearson. An amazing pastor had an enormous large church in America. Massive, had a massive influence on people. And this serpent, this evil serpent started crawling his way. Hear this. Just because somebody is an amazing preacher doesn't mean they have a good prayer life. Just because they're brilliant at teaching the Word doesn't mean they live it. Jesus said, by their fruit, you will know them. You will know them. That demonic evil serpent started making its way there and started sowing seeds of doubt. And then after, once the seed was taken, then deception kicked in. This man walked away from the calling of God. You know what he said? No longer believes in the Bible. He says the Bible is inspired word of man. And he also said that everyone goes to heaven. Hell does not exist. Beware, beware of the serpent. This story alone, this passage alone uh, in Genesis, there's four things that I want to highlight this morning for I call them red flags or alarms that you would think Adam and Eve Adam and Eve you know would have picked up you know in regards to this you know but they completely completely missed it literally 
And the first one is this. You see, the devil knows that God is a God of order, yeah? He knows that God is a God of order. He knows that Adam is the head. Who did the serpent go to first? Eve. What's his motive? To undermine God's authority. And undermine God's authority. But the hidden motive is there. Is also to try to elevate Eve saying, Hey, listen, you don't need him. You can do it on your own. I was thinking, Eve, why didn't you say, Hey, serpent, talk to Adam. Hey, listen, beware of the works of the enemy. Sometimes it sounds really, really nice, but beware of the underlying motives. That spirit of trying to undermine authority is very active today. You see it in families, you see it in marriages, you see it in churches, you see it in society today. Beware of that spirit trying to creep in. And the second thing, in this passage here that you would have thought Adam and Eve would pick up is this a talking serpent is not normal and no animals in the uh, uh, animals in the garden of Eden did not talk I tried to reason were the animals talking no no animal was talking so for Eve to have a conversation with the serpent something in her should have said hey uh, this is not normal why are you even talking to me? Hear this. There are some conversation that Christians have with others. There are some conversation that you know in your spirit you should not have. Some conversation that you know is polluting, it pollutes your spirit. You know, yeah, I shouldn't be talking about this. Yet Eve just went along with it. Where was the, uh, hang on, this is not normal. Are you hearing, hearing what I'm saying? Beware of the serpent. This is one of the reasons why the enemy has forced his way and destroyed good, solid, strong Christians through wrong conversation. Because it sows a seed and then it gets into your head and then you start doubting and then before you know it, you've believed a deception. And the fourth, the third thing in this, just in this passage alone is this, where was Adam? Adam was right there, standing there because the Bible says, notice, she also, uh, uh, she also gave some to her husband who was with her. Where was Adam? With her. Why didn't he open his mouth? In other words, Adam is standing right there listening to this conversation. Yet, he kept his mouth shut. Can I just say this? Husbands, husband, hear this. There comes a time when you and I, we need to open our mouths. <laughs> yeah? We need to open our mouths. Stop being now. Yes, we know that God knew what He was doing. But there's a lesson in here for all of us. There comes a time when we need to open our mouth. Notice when Eve took the fruit, notice nothing happened. When she ate the fruit, notice nothing happened. When she swallowed the fruit, notice nothing happened. Nothing happened. The only time when things happen, when who? When Adam took the fruit. Husband, let me say this cautiously. <laughs> if you're going to go down that track, you might as well go there and pray for forgiveness after, you know. Hear this, husband. God is a God of order, even though Eve was the one that took it. Who got the blame? Adam. Here's the thought, man. If you know that your wife is doing the wrong thing, your wife is doing the wrong thing, and you know that it's morally wrong, or you, you just know that it's wrong, 
You need to speak. You need to pull her up. Ouch. Okay. You need to pull her up. Listen, there's a word for that. It's called being the head. Don't just sit there and say, wow, well, she'll learn. Because as far, listen, as far as God is concerned, you are responsible because you're the head. So don't just sit there and hope like mad that she'll learn. No, you need to speak. You need to, honey, you need to stop. Husbands and all the wives say, now ladies, listen, your turn ladies. If your husband pulls you up, don't throw a tantrum. Don't manifest. Don't start to cook your own dinner. <laughs> Don't start the you sleeping on the couch. Listen, be grateful that you have a man who loves you enough to speak the truth. Adam should have opened his mouth, but he kept it shut. Now, I have heard men and as you know, we, 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 so many marriage counseling we've done over the years. I've heard so many men saying, ah, oh, look, I just want to keep the peace. And I said, well, how's that going? I said, that, based on what you're saying, you guys have not been peace in the last six months. And you're still keeping quiet. Hey, listen, there comes a time when we need to speak. Worry about the emotions after it. It's the truth that sets people free. And God's people say, that's one of the giftings I have in my family. Always speak. Sometimes you know there's gonna be consequences, but you speak because it's the freedom, it's the truth that sets you free. And God's people say, do you still love me? And fourthly, fourthly, I want you to listen to this, fourthly, the world was perfect, completely perfect, yes, at this point. There was no such thing as sin because everything was perfect, created by a perfect God. Adam and Eve, they were in the perfect presence of Jesus, yeah? The perfect presence of God. Yet, in the perfect presence of God, notice the devil still managed to get in them and deceive them. Deceive them. Even though they were in the massive, perfect presence of God. Hear this. Prayer keeps us in the presence of God. Prayer keeps us spiritually alert. That's what prayer draws us into the presence of God. But hear this. The Bible is our weapon. The Bible is our direction. The Bible is the tool that we use because the devil got in there and tried to twist God's word. Hear this, prayer alone is good but not great. Prayer and the Bible, they go together. It gives you direction. I've come across a lot of people as a massive, enormous intercession, intercessory gifting. And I go, praise Jesus. I'm glad, but some of them are weird, as you know, because sometimes they say things that is not even scriptural, literally. Now, I, I know they have a good heart, so I encourage them prayer and the Bible, they go together so that what we say flows out from the Word of God. God will never contradict His Word. He's governed by His Word. Amen. For us today, we intercede, we should be in the presence of God. Because that's what helps us spiritually alert. But we also need to arm ourselves daily with the Bible, with the Word of God. So that you, you have the maturity to know things that are from the Lord and things that are not from the Lord. Amen. I often have people come up. Praise God, not necessarily from our church now because 
you guys have learned. But others come up and said, like I had one guy said, hey, pastor, I think we should do this, this and this. In which I go, yeah, thank you. You know, but you can tell that some of them suggest things that is not even in line with the word. That's how you know if something is from the Lord or not. These four things that Adam and Eve, they should have picked up, you know, but the enemy used them to destroy and bring division in their life. And today is still affecting the world today. For us today, this is just part one. Next week, we're going to be looking at strongholds, how the enemy uses strongholds to keep people in bondage. Normally, once again, it starts off with a little tiny seed of, of um, uh, a doubt, but then it goes into deception. Let me ask you this. What are some of the seeds? What are some of the things that you have believed that is from the enemy? Beware of the serpent. Some of us have fallen into the traps that the enemy has set. He comes to kill, steal, and to destroy. Just in conclusion, I remember before we got married, we had a lot of good friends, caring friends, Christian friends. They would come and say things like, oh, you know, we wish you all the best. And then they say things like, you know, the first 12 months or the first two years is the hardest. Or well, the first five years is the hardest. Have you heard that? Yeah? Or well, the first six years is the hardest. You know? And I thought, okay, well, thank you for sharing that information uh, with me. Thank you. But I have an attitude. That is, that's not what my Bible says. That's not what prayer says. Now, hear this. I have never said that we have a perfect marriage. We've never said that. But I can honestly say this before God, there has never been a hard year. Yes, you have your ups and downs, but there's never been a hard year. Where you come across some couples, oh, the third year was the hardest, the fourth year was the hardest. Listen, I normally bring it back to this, but how often do you pray together? There are some problems that you're trying to deal with logically. How's that guy? There are some problems that must be dealt with spiritually. And you can't deal spiritual problem logically. It has to be dealt spiritually. This is why we've made prayer as the foundation of our family. Not because we're pastors, because I can assure you, some pastors don't do that. And you can tell, you know, because by their fruit, you will know them. I wanted this to be the foundation of the Seyuli so that our kids grow up and build. I want them to be strong, not weak. Strong in the land. How do we do that? By us cultivating an atmosphere of prayer so that when the serpent tries to creep in, he doesn't get through. Because you're spiritually aware and you're armed with the Word of God. And God's people say, so you do that and then after that, then we had the old, so once you get married, you grow, then we had kids, and then you hear, oh, you wait till they're two. Oh, the terrible two. And then it was the terrible fours, you know. You know, thought, oh, thank you for sharing that information with us, you know. But again, I have this attitude that as we raise them up in the ways of the Lord, and not only we raise them up in the ways of the Lord, but we used a massive tool that God gave us in raising our kids called the hand. See, society hates that. Society gets offended over that. And look how the kids are today. And they're trying to, we raise them up in the ways of the Lord. Amen. God's word works. God's word works. And we understand that some people have taken it too far where they go to one. Listen, those parents, they need to face the full force of the law. We understand that. But here's reality. If the road rule says 50, how many people will do 60 or 70? Should we change the road rule because of that? Yeah. There's always going to be parents that take it too far. 
For you and I were governed by the word of God. And God's people say, you raise it because God knows what he's doing. Beware of the serpent. It's always interesting when we have parents that come to us to counseling. And you can tell there is no order in them. Literally no order. So we encourage them to bring order and boundaries. And it's good when parents work together. But it's very challenging when you've got one parent doing the right thing and the other parent do. So we encourage them, listen, do you love your kids? Of course we love our kids. Then you need to do this. Otherwise, guess what? That very child is going to hurt you. Beware of the serpent. Let's stand together this morning. Every head bow and every eyes close. Thank you, God. Are there areas in your life where you know the serpent has managed to get in there and managed to deceive you? Because every time we compromise the Word of God, you fall into the traps of the enemy. Yeah? You fall into the traps of the enemy. What are the traps that I have seen Christians fall into is sex outside of marriage. Listen, it's a trap and you see that. Uh, drugs, it's a trap and they justify these things. Hey listen, the Bible is still black and white, sin is sin. Yeah. Amen? And, to, and it breaks God's heart when we water down you know, with the enemy makes his way in there and deceives us you know every person that has turned away from god it starts with the seed of doubt and then it flows into deception so every head bow and every eyes close this morning had it in mind i wanted to anoint some people this morning just anoint you with with oil and i want you to be honest with god uh, there are some areas in your life where you realize, man, I've compromised this. I've watered that down. Can I encourage you? God is a God of love. He's a forgiving God. He's a God of second chances. So we want to anoint you and start making a good godly stand today. And secondly, if you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, today is your day. Today is the time you're coming.